I have to talk to you. Are you listening? In 1900, I had produced Purcell's opera Dido and Aeneas in London. In 1901, I had produced Purcell's mask from his opera Diocletian. And in 1902, Handel's Aces and Galatea. In 1902, I produced a play, Bethlehem, by Lawrence Hausman at the Imperial Institute in London. In 1903, at the Imperial Theatre, not the Institute, I produced Ibsen's Vikings of Helgoland and Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. We had, in three years, launched some of the most original stage ideas of the century. It is now necessary, I think necessary, to stop, forget all else, and positively look, take a long and careful look at nature. To have made machines to project light, to color it, to increase its strength, and to dim it only proves a waste of time and patience if we've forgotten to find out what it is that light does. And to note a few of its lesser, obvious, and certainly more expressive and more subtle effects. As there is such a thing as always looking before you leap, so you must, I think, look before you light a stage. We shall soon see why we have to turn once more to a more serious and careful study of light. Studying as an artist studies by looking at daylight, by looking until light dawns in us. In 1907, I think it was, I suddenly saw that the only way to get a new stage was to get a new scene. And what could that scene be? And I made the screens. William, when I came to patent them, the man said, this is the most patentable thing that he'd ever come across. Why? He said, because anybody can imitate them. They're too simple. But I would deny that as being the truth. Nobody can imitate them. windows, as we've seen, are the main channels through which the lighting enters the room and then the stage. What games the light will play when it comes in through the door or window and begins its play. The beginning of all drama is movement and this applies as much to the play of light as to any other part of the whole. Macbeth, it is the first scene of the first act that has always troubled me. As a rule, thundering voices, when shall we three meet again? Flash of lightning, thunder, and all that, basta. Instead of that, a quiet room, a big bed, Lady Macbeth asleep. And behind the curtains, you see a movement. At the beginning, it grows, this movement. One, two, three. And then the gentle voices whispered, When shall we? They have been making a charm over her. 
They have been doing their wicked business. Then they say, when shall we three meet again? Very quiet. And they answer very quietly. And it goes on until the end of the thing. Paddock calls, fair is foul and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filthy air. And at that moment, you hear from the distance the pipes of the Scotch bagpipes playing. The return of the army. Lady Macbeth makes a single movement of pain. This goes on more and more, these bagpipes. And they steal away from the room and are gone. Very quiet indeed. With Shakespeare, there is nothing real at all. I can't exaggerate that too much. We spoil Shakespeare, have done so for years, by trying to make it fit into a real house in a real room and real people. Nothing of the kind. It is a great dream, and if we can get that feeling which is in dream and in music, then we are near to Shakespeare. They were a loose set of prints. Then on the eve of being issued, in my book which was entitled Towards a New Theatre, he took them and we began going through them. And every now and then he picked out certain designs and put them aside in a heap. These designs which he had put aside, he now took up and spread out before him. Then leaning back in his chair, he settled down and looked at them again, saying a word which was more often used in Italy, bella, which means beautiful. But to receive praise was not my object in showing the designs to Salvini. I wanted to hear one thing from him as the representative of the great days of acting, and one thing only. So I asked him, will you please tell me, can the actor act in such a scene? He turned round, for I was behind him, as if the ghost in Hamlet was about to appear before him. He frowned and he said, these scenes liberate the actor. They liberate him from the little gothic room in which he has been stuck. Then he touched one of the steps in one of the designs. You felt that he wanted to be moving on it. I then told him that in England actors put forward the argument that although the scenes were beautiful in themselves, they were quite impossible to be acted in. His eyebrows went up and down rapidly. He touched the design again with the tip of his fingers, and he said in measured tones this. The actor who cannot act in that scene is no true artist. Non è artista. And so that first meeting with Tommaso Salvini in 1913 is one of the memorable days of my life. When old men of 30, 40 or 50 had seen a foe in me and looked upon me and my ideas as a danger to themselves, this young man of 82 or 84 saw a friend and gave me a guarantee that my principles will prevail. At that time, the streets of Moscow were not very well paved and one drove in sledges in great silence on snow-strewn ground. I remember this silence very well. In the cold air, only the voices of people rang out clearly along the roads. My welcome was a warm-hearted one. 
Stanislavski told me that he and his company would assist me in every possible way. Also that I was to use their theatre as if it were my own. They could not have been kinder, and I am sure their intentions were very good indeed. This Florentine model was quite a large one made in wood, and its parts were movable. Screens of all sizes. The size of the model was about six feet wide and seven feet to seven feet six inches high. We began preliminary rehearsals to the screens in front of us. Each scene was composed of my screens and a number of nicely made bits, which I called extra pieces. They have never to this day been properly used. And should I die, before I can show how these screens should be used, their amazing values will never come to be understood. No. Now, do not please suppose that because I made these little screens, I speak of them as having done an amazing work. I have not. But the screens themselves are magical, and I am the only one that understands their magic. I have something to say about Isadora Duncan. She was the first and only dancer I ever saw when she died, it seemed to some of us the dancing ceased. She projected the dance into this world of ours in full belief that what she was doing was right and great. And it was. She was speaking in her own language. Do you understand? her own language, and so she came to move, as no one had ever seen anyone move before. And if she is speaking, what is it she's saying? No one would ever be able to report truly or exactly, yet no one present had one moment's doubt it is extraordinary, isn't it? Only this can we say, that she was telling to the air the very thing we all longed to hear. Until she came, we had never dreamed we should hear it. And now we heard them. She put on some bits of stuff, which when hung upon a peg, look more like torn rags than anything else. When she put them on, they became transformed. She transformed them into marvels of beauty, and at every step she took, they spoke. I do not exaggerate. I know something about my art after 20 years study. I want to know more. I want to know enough to be of use to those who can do more. I want to leave behind me the seeds of the art, for it does not yet exist, and such seeds are not to be discovered in a moment. So let your machines be simple, and let your craftsmen be skilled, and let an artist supervise everything. And in the staging of a play, as in the writing of it, heart and head and hand must be as one. <laughs>